we're going to be talking about um, the Emergent Church some. And my husband and I live in Granville, and we both have quite a number of friends that go to um, one of the biggest um, Emergent Churches here in Michigan. Um, so we were both given some um, sermon DVDs and videos and other materials um, from our friends. And we looked at them, and then we started um, kind of looking into the Emergent Church. Um, I also work at um, a Catholic hospital, so I have a large number of Catholic friends. Um, and there's a lot of um, kind of spiritualistic um, type things starting to go on um, in that faith. And I was having a lot of discussions with people um, at work about some of those things. So um, that's kind of the other angle I learned about this from. So I started looking into it more. And I probably started looking into this about a year and a half ago when a dear friend of mine from out of state called me up and told me that they are non-Adventists. She called me up and told me that the church that they were attending, the Methodist Church, both of her children went to the youth group there. And she said, you know, I don't understand what's happening because the pastor there in the youth department is having the kids do meditation. She said, but it's Eastern style meditation and my kids knew better than that. They didn't close their eyes and they didn't go along with it. But then he's also teaching them to do the sign of the cross. And he took them on a field trip to the Catholic Church where he began to show them the artifacts that were there and, and he went ahead and baptized himself with holy water while he was there. And she said, I don't understand because that's not Methodist. I don't know why he's doing that. And of course, being a Seventh-day Adventist, when you hear Protestants acting Catholic, you're, you begin to think of prophecy. And so I got very interested. She called me back a couple days later and told me that she had discovered that what her church was involved with was something called the Emergent Church. I didn't know anything about it, and so I began to go online and study into it. And as I began to study into it, it began to be more and more involved and more and more rather fascinating and very prophetic. Um, and so that's what we're here to talk about this afternoon. In Jude we read, Beloved, when I gave you all diligence to write to you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write to you and exhort to you that you should earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men who have crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. We are in a spiritual battle. And in this presentation, um, we just want to say up front that we will be mentioning some specific organizations and sometimes even some specific individuals. And we just want to say from the very beginning, we are not trying to judge or condemn any person or any organization that we might mention. The Lord is the only one who knows their hearts. He knows the future. He knows where this is leading to. We do not. We are simply here to um, expose error that is out there and that is creeping in and to exalt the truth. As Seventh-day Adventists, we're very used to considering ourselves the remnant. I think to a certain degree we take a bit of pride in that. We're the remnant, we have the truth, we're the ones to give the three angels' message, we're the ones to point out Babylon and to bring people to the truth. And there's a certain element of maybe comfortability in being that type, of being the remnant and being the one who gets to give the message to someone else. And I think there's also a danger in that because we feel very confident and sometimes we can become complacent. And that's where Laodicea moves in, and we end up being just too comfortable and feeling a bit too secure with what we have. If you look at our little illustration here, you'll see that we've used the illustration of a tree. And in the branches, um, we have some of the doctrines. We have the health message, state of the dead, the Sabbath, the second coming, the sanctuary. And these are the things that we often 
feel like this is where we're going to be attacked. This is where we have to be sharp. This is where we need to be um, staying on top of. And these are the things that we're going to have to bring to other people so that they can understand the truth and come into the safety also. But if you look at the illustration, you'll realize that all those things are built upon the foundation of truth and scripture and ultimately Jesus Christ himself. And so today we're going to focus a little bit more on the roots. And because you see, with today's new spirituality, the attack is somewhat up in the branches. I'm not going to say that it doesn't exist up there. There's a lot of battle that takes place on doctrinal levels. But way deeper than that is what Satan is beginning to do. And that is an attack of truth itself, on the Bible itself, and ultimately on who Jesus is. Ellen White tells us that it is true that spiritualism is now changing its form and veiling some of its more objectionable features. Even assuming a Christian guise, even in its present form, so far from being more worthy of toleration than formerly, it is really a more dangerous because a more subtle deception. While it formerly denounced Christ and the Bible, it now professes to accept both. And that's what we're going to talk about now. We're going to look at the new spirituality and how this new spirituality is claiming to accept the Word of God, Jesus Christ, and Christianity to a certain extent, but especially the Word of God and Jesus Christ. Um, we're going to start now by going back 100 years um, to some of the history of Adventism and some very interesting things that happened in Battle Creek. Um, this is a picture of John Harvey Kellogg and the first sanitarium. Um, and Dr. Kellogg was a very respected and prominent member of the Adventist Church. Um, over a period of years, though, um, Dr. Kellogg began to have um, some pantheistic leanings. Um, he wrote a book um, that contained some of his ideas, and that was called Living Temple. And he promoted his ideas in that book um, as Christian doctrine. Ellen White tells us that in Living Temple, um, Dr. Kellogg's book, the assertion is made that God is in the flower, in the leaf, in the sinner. But God does not live in the sinner. The word declares that he abides only in the hearts of those who love him and do righteousness. God does not abide in the heart of the sinner. It is the enemy who abides there. So what was in this book? Ellen White calls it pantheism and mysticism. And again, we want to point out that Kellogg denied um, that he was a pantheist and held all along that his concept was nothing more than omnipresence. I have a little book here. Um, I have a little one-year-old daughter, and we were given this beautiful little book um, at one of our baby showers. Um, and it says, I'm very full of joy today. God made me in a special way. I praise him as I walk along. I praise him with my special song. Now listen carefully on this page. It's times like these I take delight in ladybugs and bees in flight. I see God in the sky of blue. He's in the grass and flowers too. Is God in the grass and flowers? This sounds like a really, really innocent idea, a cute book, you know. But Ellen White goes on to explain to us what a dangerous, dangerous idea this actually is. So again, what is pantheism and why is it so bad? It's the belief that God is in everything and everyone. It's the root of spiritualism and the occult, um, as well as Eastern religions, including Hinduism and Buddhism, and mystical sects of all the major religions, including Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. The problem with um, pantheism is that it negates the holiness of God, um, and it makes him into something that we can control and manipulate. Um, it goes right back to the first sin in the universe when Lucifer wanted to be God. He wanted to be like God. And then when Eve was in the garden and Lucifer told her, if you eat this fruit, you can be like God. You can be as God. If God is in us, then we need to connect um, with that God that's inside of us. And that's how pantheism causes or encourages or promotes mysticism. We commune with the God inside ourselves, the God in the flower, the God in whatever, and we have this natural desire in our hearts, which God has put in our hearts, to commune with him, to have a relationship with him. But this um, desire becomes distorted, um, so we try to commune with objects or with our own sinful selves in order to reach God. 
Ellen White um, had a vision in which she saw um, Dr. Kellogg speaking on the subject of life and God's relationship to all living things. Um, and he actually did do this. He was going around having seminars and talking about these ideas. Um, she said, um, we were on no account to enter into discussion with those who hold pantheistic theories on these subjects. Just as surely as the angels who fell were seduced and deceived by Satan, so surely was the speaker under the spiritualistic education of evil angels. So this is a pretty scary statement. Um, she's connecting here very closely pantheism and spiritualism and giving us a warning of how dangerous these ideas are. Another warning to flee from pantheism. Truth, present truth, is all that the word of God represents it to be. The Lord would have his people keep themselves from all superfluities, from all that tends to mysticism. Let those who are tempted to indulge in fanciful imaginary doctrines sink the shaft deep into the quarries of heavenly truth. So again, she tells us here um, that some people will be tempted. So there are those of us, maybe even in the Adventist church, that will be tempted to buy into these ideas um, because they appeal to our sinful, selfish hearts. But she points out that the word of God, God's word, the Bible, is our protection. Another quote. We need not the mysticism that is in this book. Those who entertain these sophistries will soon find themselves in a position where the enemy can talk with them and lead them away from God. It is represented to me that the writer of this book is on a false track. He has lost sight of the distinguishing truths for this time. He knows not whether his steps are tending. The track of truth lies close beside the track of error, and both tracks may seem to be one to minds which are not worked by the Holy Spirit, and which therefore are not quick to discern the difference between truth and error. Again, she's pointing out the connection of pantheism, mysticism, and spiritualism. And she points out how subtle that difference can sometimes be, how difficult it can be to, to see these things. We are very blessed um, to have this prophetic warning from Sister White. She goes on now to explain um, that these pantheistic, mystical, spiritualistic ideas that Dr. Kellogg had would be reintroduced into the church in the last days. And she referred to this happening as the Omega. That's what she called it. Here's some quotes on that subject. She says, Living Temple contains the alpha of these theories. I knew that the Omega would follow in a little while, and I trembled for our people. In the book Living Temple, there is presented the alpha of deadly heresies. The Omega will follow and will be received by those who are not willing to heed the warning God has given. So again, a gracious warning we have here from God about some things that will happen in the last days. Now tell me, what is the result of not um, heeding the warning that God has given? What will happen to us if we don't listen to what God tells us? That's when Satan comes in and he chops down our tree right to the roots. He separates us from Jesus. Um, so those of you who are into Adventist history realize that this is a really, really condensed version of what happened in Battle Creek. Um, so a lot of people left the church over this. Ellen White ended up warning parents not to send their children to the school in Battle Creek. Um, there were some pretty dramatic things, including God burning down some buildings in Battle Creek. So if you're interested in these things, we encourage you to look into them. Um, but Ellen White wrote extensively about this. Um, and she gives some characteristics in her writings that the Omega will have. So now we're going to lay out for you some of those characteristics that she mentions, and we are going to compare them to the characteristics of what is called the emergent church. Um, and just to explain what the emergent church is, um, it's a loose organization of Protestant pastors and authors um, that want to reinvent um, Christianity, as they call it. Um, the emergent church is not um, a denomination. There's no headquarters. There's no official doctrine. Um, it's more of a loose organization of these authors and pastors, and they kind of organize themselves through books and on websites um, through the Internet. So here is this um, comparison between the characteristics of the Omega and the characteristics of the emergent church and the new spirituality. There's targeting of the youth, um, misinterpretation of the Bible, subtle undermining of the Bible, pantheism, mysticism, a low regard of doctrines, um, a non-sectarian ecumenical focus, um, and a big emphasis on social justice. And a lot of these things are good things, um, but these are what Ellen White points out to us will be present in this Omega. And we want to point out here that um, the things that we've listed for the emergent church, the new spirituality here, we're not um, coming up with these ideas on, their, on our own. These are straight from the mouths of big emergent authors or leaders. 
um, and there's multiple, multiple quotes. We're just going to give you a few in each subject um, that they profess to have these. They say they want to reinterpret the Bible. They say they have a low regard of doctrine. Um, and again, um, the Emergent Church, since it's not a, a denomination, there's kind of a spectrum of what different people in it believe. So the average person coming to church on Sunday morning and sitting in the pew in the church of an emergent pastor probably does not know that their pastor is thinking all of these things, um, but you know, he'll be mentioning some little phrases in his sermons and things that maybe they don't even notice, um, but these ideas are starting to creep in. So here are a few of the things we're going to briefly explore. Um, the reinterpretation of Revelation in the Bible, um, some of these other things here. Let's get this. Um, and, and I want to mention too, Anne has actually attended um, a, a service at um, the, one of the big emergent churches in the area. And I've watched some of those DVDs and those videos. And you know, a lot of them are really, really good. These are good speakers. And a lot of what they're talking about is, you know, straight Bible truth. But then there's these little things, you know, in here that are really confusing. And that's what makes it really dangerous. Um, this next quote that I'm going to read to you is um, by Rob Bell. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Rob Bell. Um, he's the pastor of Mars Hill Bible Church right down the road in Granville. Um, he's the star of the NUMA videos. Um, and he's also the author of a lot of books. And again, like we said before, we want to make clear that we don't question Mr. Bell's um, sincerity or his you know, desire to honor God, but um, it does appear that he is really deceived by some of the quotes and things that he has, has in his book. So here's one of those quotes. What if tomorrow someone digs up definitive proof that Jesus had a real earthly biological father named Larry? The virgin birth was just a bit of mythologizing the gospel writers threw in. Could you still be a Christian? If the whole faith falls apart when we re-examine it, wasn't that strong in the first place, was it? So now later on in this chapter in Velvet Elvis, um, Rob goes on to say that as of right now, he still does believe in the virgin birth, um, but that if he did find out it wasn't true, he could still live as a Christian. However, this is still a serious undermining of the authority of the scriptures because the implication is that, you know, the truth of the Bible has no impact on what it means to be a Christian. Also, it's kind of written in a way that makes you feel like your faith is weak if you actually believe the literal words of the Bible. Here's another quote. This is not just the same old message with new methods, Rob says. We're rediscovering Christianity as an Eastern religion, as a way of life. The Bells started questioning their assumptions about the Bible itself, discovering the Bible as a human product, as Rob puts it, rather than the product of divine fiat. The Bible is still in the center for us, Rob says, but it's a different kind of center. We want to embrace mystery rather than conquer it. So here's a reference again to mystery um, and a reference to the Eastern mystical um, religions. Remember what we were warned about with the Omega? Um, he's also very explicit here that this is a new interpretation of the Christian message and a new interpretation of the Bible. Um, there are many texts in the Bible, including in Galatians, 2 John 10, other places that warn us um, that a new doctrine or a new gospel is something that we should be very wary of. Some more quotes. Jesus is the only Savior, but not everybody who is being saved by him is aware that he is the one doing the saving. What I'm trying to say is that Jesus, who incarnated God 2,000 years ago, is mystically present and waiting to be discovered in every person you and I encounter. This is another one of the big, um, biggest emergent authors. Um, so in this version of... Um, the gospel, Jesus is present in the hearts of every human being, um, regardless of whether or not they have repented of sin um, and invited Jesus into their hearts. This is simply not what the Bible teaches. And see the correlation here between the pantheism in Dr. Kellogg's ideas and this same idea. Another quote from Mr. Bell here. The goal of Jesus isn't to get into heaven. The goal is to get heaven here. When people use the word hell, what do they mean? They mean a place, an event, a situation absent of how God desires things to be. Famine, debt, oppression, loneliness, despair, death, slaughter, they are all hell on earth. Jesus' desire for his followers is that they live in such a way that they bring heaven to earth. What's disturbing is when people talk more about hell after this life than they do about hell here and now. 
as a Christian, I want to do what I can to resist hell coming to earth. So this is kind of a different um, interpretation of the kingdom of God. Um, he kind of is pointing out here the works-oriented method um, that Christ followers can bring the kingdom of God to earth. And this also ties in very closely with the New Age ideas that heaven and hell are not actually real places, they're just states of mind. Another quote on the authority of the Bible um, from Rob Bell. The Bible is a collection of stories that teach us about what it looks like when God is at work through actual people. The Bible has the authority it does only because it contains stories about people interacting with the God who has all the authority. So you can see here there's no um, mention of the inspiration of the Bible. Um, and this is a very different view of the Bible than what Protestants have traditionally held. The idea of um, sola scriptura that the reformers died for um, is very distant from this new interpretation of the Bible. The emergent church and the new spirituality heavily promote um, ecumenicism, which is the idea of unity among different religions. Leonard Sweet, who's um, another big name, says, New light embodiment means to be in connection and information with other faiths. One can be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ without denying the flickers of the sacred and followers of Yahweh or Kali or Krishna. Rick Warren says, I happen to know other people who are followers of Christ in other religions. So it's interesting to note here again that the emergent um, church leaders like to call themselves um, Christ followers instead of Christians. And this is a kind of a different idea. Um, all that's required to be a Christ follower um, is to say, yeah, that Jesus, he had some good teachings. You don't have to accept Jesus as, you know, your savior um, of your sins to be a Christ follower. And again, um, note in these um, comments, the pantheistic idea that God um, is in the followers of false gods like um, Kali and Krishna. A few more quotes on ecumenicism. Um, and these quotes are actually from some mystics that um, emergent church leaders like to quote heavily. This first one, Thomas Burton, is a Catholic theologian. He says, I, know, I see no contradiction between Buddhism and Christianity. I intend to become as good a Buddhist as I can. And this is a pretty popular idea right now. I don't know if um, any of you have had any experience with this, but um, it's kind of trendy to be Buddhist right now. It's kind of hip. Um, and I, some of my Catholic friends, I know one in particular that says, yeah, I'm a Buddhist and I'm a Catholic. So this is a new idea that's really creeping in here. Um, a quote from Peter Kreeft, Allah is not another God. We worship the same God, the same God, the very same God we worship in Christ is the God the Jews and the Muslims worship. So this is another interesting idea that's becoming very popular right now. Um, I think we can all agree that the God who appeared to Abraham, um, that the Jews and um, the Muslims and the Christians all acknowledge is the same God, that God appeared to Abraham. But did God appear to Muhammad in the cave? Did God appear to Buddha or to Alice Bailey or to Joseph Smith? No, this is a deception, um, but this is becoming a more and more popular idea, and it's an ideal bridge um, to unite the world religions. The Bible warns us about um, world religions uniting at the end of time. Now, these few quotes have been a small, small sample of some of these ideas. You could go out and research this a lot more if you want to, um, but there's a strong emphasis on ecumenicism between the emergent church and world religions, and now we're going to shift gears a little bit and see how the spiritualism and mysticism that are present in the Roman Catholic religion are being used as a unifying thread between Catholics and Protestants. So remember, the emergent church movement that we talked about um, is currently rooted in American churches that consider themselves Protestant. So now we're going to move to the Catholic side of this. Um, this is in, from an interview that Tony Campolo gave. Again, he's one of the big emergent church leaders. He says, what I'm saying is that when we had the Protestant Reformation, we left so much good behind us in Catholicism. We need to have a rapprochement. We need to get back in touch with our Catholic brothers and sisters. We need to say, we can teach you some things, but you can teach us even more. Catholics have spent centuries developing relationships with God and many forms of prayer. And as Protestants, we're largely unaware of those wonderful forms of prayer. There's a spirituality in Catholicism that we need to reclaim. 
We can hold on to our Reformation theologies, but we had better get back into pre-Reformation spirituality. I think we as Adventists are typically on guard when we hear someone say that we should reverse the Reformation. Um, and the mystical forms of prayer that Mr. Campolo is referring to are the same forms of meditative prayer that the pantheistic Buddhists, Hindus, and mystics of all world religions use to access the spirit world um, and have spiritual experiences. And note here again how he's saying that, go ahead, keep your doctrines. You can have your doctrines, that's fine. We're going to come together on something much bigger than doctrines. We're going to come together on this mystical idea of um, spirituality. This is the December cover of U.S. World and News, Re US News and World Report. I don't know how many of you saw it. Um, it says, why many modern worshipers, including Catholics, Jews, and evangelicals, are embracing tradition. Protestantism is beginning to return to Catholic practices right before our eyes. What does it mean to be a Protestant? What are elements of Catholicism that the Reformers were pr protesting against? Often we think of um, the Bible not being accessible. We think of um, the authority of the Pope. Um, there are many other aspects as well, including um, the spiritual practices of the church that we were trying to leave behind in Catholicism. They include the meditation, the Eucharistic adoration, um, the use of Lectio Divina, um, the ritualistic, liturgical um, services, um, the belief in the Pope, and more. Um, because people during the Dark Ages didn't have access to the Bible, um, the church tried to use all these experiences, all these other things, to kind of keep a connection with the people, to keep the people dependent on the church. Um, so why are we seeing a return of these rituals and these mystical experiences when we have Bibles everywhere? It's kind of interesting that we have all these Bibles, but maybe we don't read them. Maybe we don't, we don't know what's in the Bible. We don't know the Word of God for ourselves. Um, I you know I appreciate our pastor in the Holland Church, Pastor Craig. Um, I've heard him say at our communion services, you know, this bread that we have right here, this is not actually the body of Christ. This is a symbol. It's not actually the bottle of Christ, body of Christ. But if you start to hear people in your churches saying, you know, here, this is the body of Christ, watch out because you're headed right back to Rome. Another quote from Ellen White here. She clear, the Bible clearly warns us um, of these things. And Sister White states, Through the two great errors, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring the people under his deceptions. While the latter lays the foundation of spiritualism, while the former lays this, the foundation of spiritualism, the latter creates a bond of sympathy with Rome. The Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism. They will reach over the abyss to clasp hands with the Roman power. And under the influence of this threefold union, this country will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling on the rights of consciousness. Remember what Tony Campola just told us about how we Protestants should embrace the mystical prayer of Catholicism? It ties together these two ideas. Another warning here from prophecy about these things happening. Um, now we're going to talk a bit more in detail about what exactly um, this mysticism and spiritualism that we're talking about looks like um, in churches today. Um, Dan Kimball in his book, The Emergent Church, says, in the emerging culture, darkness represents spirituality. We see this in Buddhist churches, Catholic, Orthodox. Darkness communicates that something serious is happening. Um, this contemplative spirituality that we're going to talk about is a mystical method of worshiping God. Um, and like we've just discussed, the Protestant Reformation attempted to free us from the requirement of worshiping God in a certain way, in a mystical manner. But emergent church leaders are urging us to return to this Catholic spirituality. And tell me, Adventists, what is the test about in the last days? What's the final test over? Worship. Yeah, it's about the day of worship. It's about the Sabbath. But it's also about the manner in which we worship. Sometimes we focus on the Sabbath and we think, oh, everything else that we do in our worship is fine as long as we're doing it on the Sabbath. Um, but God repeatedly tells us in the Bible um, that it's not okay for us just to worship in any way that we see fit. Um, so it's important that we understand this topic. Um, the examples in the Bible include the story of Nadab and Abihu and their, and their strange fire. 
I mean, I've actually heard a sermon from you guys' former pastor, Mark Howard, on that topic. I don't know if any of you remember that. Um, do you remember the, the children of Israel with their golden calf? We heard about that this morning. The false worship is something that God explicitly condemns. God does care how we worship him. So here is a definition of contemplative spirituality. A belief system that uses ancient mystical practices to induce altered states of consciousness, the silence, and is rooted in mysticism and the occult, but often wrapped in Christian terminology. The premise of contemplative spirituality is pantheistic. God is in all. So here are some elements of contemplative spirituality. They include um, the labyrinth, icons, rosaries, prayer stations, contemplative prayer. These are all methods of inducing um, these altered states of consciousness in an effort to have a spiritual experience with God. Um, for example, promoters of the labyrinth will tell us that when you walk in a labyrinth, you have to have this kind of passive, um, receptive mindset um, so that you may gain a connection with God while you're in the labyrinth. And the same thing with the, with the rosy, it's a rosary. It's a repetitive motion, and it's um, a repetitive chanting of a word over and over again. Um, and the goal is kind of to empty your mind so that you can communicate with God um, or hear the God that is actually inside of you, because remember, we're all part of God. We're not. This is a, a, from a discussion with Thomas Merton, who, remember, was a Catholic theologian, and he popularized and promoted contemplative prayer um, in modern times. Um, during a conference on contemplative prayer, the question was put to Thomas Merton, how can we best help people to attain union with God? His answer was very clear. We must tell them that they are already united with God. Contemplative prayer is nothing other than coming into consciousness of what is already there. So see the pantheism here again. Here's a um, discussion of the contemplative prayer technique. Um, this is from Gary Thomas's book. Um, his books are promoted by Focus on the Family. I don't know if any of you are familiar with him. Um, he's an advocate of what is known in Eastern religions as mantra meditation. Um, it's particularly difficult to describe this type of prayer in writing as it is best taught in person. In general, however, centering prayer works like this. Choose a word, Jesus or Father, for example, as a focus for contemplative prayer. Repeat the word silently in your mind for a set amount of time, say 20 minutes, until your heart seems to be repeating the word by itself, just as naturally and involuntarily as breathing. Again, this clearly is not um, the same thing as meditating on the word of God as the Bible describes it. Um, this is an Eastern religion practice that is um, designed to induce an altered state of consciousness. Jesus instructed his followers um, on how to pray in many places. There's so many examples in the Bible of what biblical prayer looks like. Um, but one of the things he told his followers with it was that they were to love him with all of their minds. They're not to empty our minds. We are to love God with all of our minds. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Um, some other specific texts in the Bible are um, 1 Timothy 6.20, which talks about um, vain babblings or vain repetitions, idle babblings. Another quote here. You will never find God by looking outside yourself. You will only find God within. It will only be when you have come to experience God in your own heart and let God into the corridors of your heart, or rather found God there, that you will be able to know that there is indeed a God and that you are not separate from God. Once again, this is not what the Bible teaches. Another quote here, our spiritual journey, especially contemplative prayer, together with its practices for daily life, are processes of becoming aware of just how profound that unity is with God, ourselves, other people, other living beings, the earth, and all creation. This is the heart of pantheism right here. And practitioners of contemplative spirituality tell us that this is where um, contemplative prayer leads us. Another quote from Thomas Merton, he says, It is a glorious destiny to be a member of the human race. Now I realize what we all are. If only they, people, could all see themselves as they really are, I suppose the big problem would be that we would fall down and worship each other. At the center of our being is a point of nothingness, which is untouched by sin and by illusions, a point of pure truth. This little point is the pure glory of God in us. It is in everybody. Again, I think this is a pretty explicit statement from them about what they really mean. Um, again, one of the foundational beliefs of the pantheistic religions is that we are innately good, we are not sinners because God is in us. 
the Bible tells us that we are deceiving ourselves if we believe this lie. Um, 1 John 1, 8 and 10 says, If we believe that we have no sin, we are not sinners, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. The Bible also tells us that God does not hear the prayers of the unbeliever, the wicked, or the unrepentant sinner. Um, John 9, 31, Proverbs 15, 29, and Psalms 66, 18 are examples of that. Um, practitioners of contemplative prayer or these types of meditation make it clear that everyone, everyone can experience this form of prayer um, regardless of what religion or any religion they are, they are a part of or regardless of their sinfulness um, because each person is actually a part of God. Here's a quote from Richard Foster. Um, Richard Foster was a Quaker who introduced contemplative prayer to um, the evangelicals in the 1970s. Um, his book is actually um, used as a textbook in Protestant seminaries across the country. Um, and I don't know if you know this or not, but Quakers um, have been practicing, practicing mysticism for centuries. That's like the whole central point of their religion. He says, we should all without shame enroll as apprentices in the school of contemplative prayer. Um, he gives us a warning, though, um, by this authority on contemplative prayer that you can encounter supernatural beings um, when you are using this form of prayer. Um, he says that in contemplative prayer, we are entering deeply into the spiritual realm and that sometimes it is not the realm of God, even though it is supernatural. So he says, you know, there's spiritual beings there. You might be in danger, so you need to say a prayer of protection like all dark and evil spirits must leave. Um, if this is the case, that this form of prayer can bring us into contact with spirits, this is explicitly condemned in the Bible. It's explicitly forbidden in the Bible. Um, and we are not including a lot of examples in here, but many advanced practitioners of these prayer methods um, actually receive visions or messages um, from what they refer to as God or angels. Um, but actually, we would say that these are evil spirits that are uh, misleading these people. Another quote from Leonard Sweet. He's an author, speaker, professor, and a futurist. He speaks to a lot of audiences. Um, this is from his book, Quantum Spirituality. A surprisingly central feature of all the world's religions is the language of light in communicating the divine and symbolizing the union of the human with the divine. Muhammad's light-filled cave, Moses' burning bush, Paul's blinding light, Fox's inner light, Krishna's lord of light, Bome's light-filled cobbler shop, Plotinus's fire experiences, Bodhisattva's with the flow of Kundalini's fire erupting from their fontanelles and so on. So see how he lumps all these things into the same box here? Now, what is Kundalini? Practitioners of centering prayer, Chris, Christian centering prayer, which people call it, um, tell us that they experience Kundalini symptoms. Gary says that he has these Kundalini symptoms. Richard says he feels energy or electrical current rushing through his body. Um, so what are these symptoms? Let's go a little further. Um, some of the symptoms of this energy rising up include headaches, nausea, tingling, uncontrollable t twitching, burning hot or cold moving up the spine, the body frequently vibrating. Um, kundalini actually comes from a Sanskrit word, which means the curled one, um, and it's associated with the awakening of the serpent powers in that religion. Um, energy rises up through the chakras, and it's, it's rooted in Hindu belief, and it's associated with kundalini yoga. Um, these symptoms that we've discussed are well known among um, practitioners of kundalini yoga. But doesn't it sound a lot like what the Bible describes with demon possession? With encounters with the spiritual world, it sounds dangerous. Um, so efforts to connect ourselves with the spiritual realm through these mystical practices, including meditation and yoga, can lead to these symptoms. And practitioners of the so-called Christian meditation tell us that they experience these same things. Here we have a quote from a youth pastor um, in a magazine. He says, I started using the phrase listening prayer when I talked about my own experiences in meditation. I built myself a prayer room, a tiny sanctuary in a basement closet filled with books on spiritual disciplines, contemplative prayer, and Christian mysticism. In that space, I lit candles, burned incense, hung rosaries, and listened to tapes of Benedictine monks. I meditated for hours on words, images, and sounds. I reached the point of being able to achieve alpha brain patterns, the state in which dreams occur, while still awake and meditating. 
Many other um, practitioners of contemplative prayer also mention um, this alpha brainwave consciousness. So we're going to look a little bit more into what this is and where it comes from. Um, Lori Cabot, in her book, um, The Power of the Witch, and Lori Cabot is a, she calls herself a modern day witch. She says, um, alpha is the springboard for all psychic and magical workings. It is the heart of witchcraft. You must master it first before proceeding to any other spell, ritual, or exercise in this book. So the age-old pagan um, pantheistic um, practices of meditation and altered states of consciousness can lead us to a place of great spiritual danger, even if those practices are cloaked in Christian terminology. Um, they are a method of false worship, um, which God's word condemns. What is true prayer? This is a crucial point. Ellen White tells us that prayer is the opening of the heart to God as to a friend, not that it is necessary in order to make known to God what we are, but in order to enable us to receive him. Prayer does not bring God down to us, but brings us up to him. And this is a crucial point. The Bible condemns divination, um, channeling, mediums, etc. And these are forms of mystical worship. They're the same um, things that God has warned us to avoid. Um, so we briefly reviewed here um, how the emergent Protestant leaders um, have been introducing this contemplative spirituality. We've also reviewed how this is part of the Catholic system of worship already, um, complete with its mystical and spiritualistic and pantheistic ideas. And now we're going to briefly um, look into how some of these ideas um, began to be popularized in the Catholic Church. Um, this is Ignatius of Loyola. I don't know if you are familiar with him or not, but he was the founder of the Jesuits, the Society of Jesus. Um, and the Jesuits were formed during the Reformation, um, and the purpose of the Jesuits was to destroy the Reformation, um, to urge a return to strict obedience um, to the Catholic Church. Um, and the Jesuits had many ideas and methods of meditation, contemplative spirituality, spiritual direction, and spiritual formation, um, which they used to um, initiate people into their um, Jesuit order. So here are some pictures of uh, Loyola's famous book, um, The Spiritual Exercises of St. Ignatius. You can see on the right hand, it's still being printed. You can buy it on Amazon tomorrow if you want to. Um, his spiritual exercises are meditation methods. Um, he's very clear in his book about his strong allegiance um, to the Catholic Church, and he tells us that the purpose of the meditation methods that he puts in his book are to cause people um, to develop unquestioning obedience to the Catholic Church. That's what he tells us in his book. Um, the other theme of his book is self-mastery, and um, by doing these um, meditations and spiritual exercises and stuff, you're supposed to be able to learn how to master yourself. And the purpose of that, he tells us, is so that we can devote our full allegiance, our full obedience to the Catholic Church. So here are some quotes from his book. To have the true sentiment which we ought to have in the church militant, and the church militant, remember, is the church at war, the Catholic church at war against the Protestant Reformation. To have the true sentiment which we ought to have in the church militant, let the following rules be observed. First rule, all judgment laid aside, we ought to have our mind ready and prompt to obey in all the true spouse of Christ our Lord, which is our holy mother, the church hierarchical. Another quote, to praise relics of the saints, giving veneration to them and praying to the saints, and to praise stations, pilgrimages, indulgences, pardons, cruzadas, and candles lighted in the churches. So these things that he's promoting here as very, very important are the very things that the reformers are protesting about right when this book is being written. Um, and it's interesting to note that these things are the very things that are being reintroduced into the Protestant churches today. Another quote from Ignatius. To be right in everything, we ought always to hold that the white which I see is black if the hierarchical church so decides it. So Ignatius is very clear about his firm allegiance to the Catholic Church and his desire to squash this Protestant Reformation. So what exactly were his spiritual exercises? Remember, he tells us that his spiritual exercises are designed to have us be exclusively devoted to the Catholic Church. This is a website of... Um, the Oregon province chapter of um, the Jesuits today. You can go look this up on the internet if you're interested. 
Um, on their website, it says, the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola are a month-long program of meditations, prayers, considerations, and contemplative practices that help Catholic faith become more fully alive in the everyday life of contemporary people. It presents a formulation of Ignatius's spirituality in a series of prayer exercises, thought experiments, and examinations of consciousness designed to help a retreatant, usually with the aid of a spiritual director, to experience a deeper conversion into life with God in Christ, to allow our personal stories to be interpreted by being subsumed in a story of God. So kind of a lot of words here, but um, note that the term consciousness that he refers to is not the conscious. It's kind of this world universal consciousness that the New Agers refer to. Um, and also the personal stories that he discusses tie in um, with something called narrative theology. Um, and this is something that um, the Emergent Church promotes. I'm going to show you a little brochure here. If you go to Rob Bell's church down the road, you can get this little brochure from him that explains how they do their theology. And basically what it is is, you know, there's, the Bible is full of stories, and we talked about this earlier. Remember he told us the Bible has its authority only because of the stories? So you don't get your theology from taking a text here and a text here and a text here and a text here and forming a doctrine. That's not how we do it. We just look at individual stories and we say, oh, this story can apply to my life today. So that's how we do our theology. You know, there is no such thing as forming doctrines. And this that we just read here ties in with the same idea. So I hope this is clear. Um, what Ignatius Loyola called spiritual formation is now being re-termed, called Jesuit formation, that is, is now being re-termed re as spiritual formation by Protestants, and it's being taught in churches and seminaries. So again, remember, as we move away from the truth of God's word, this kind of vacuum develops um, in which we, we try to fill this hole with experiences. Um, the same scenario occurred during the Dark Ages, and this is what is happening again today. Um, so what exactly is this spiritual formation that Loyola called Jesuit formation? Um, Richard Foster, remember we had some quotes from him earlier, um, is going to tell us what spiritual, uh, spiritual formation is. He says, when I first began writing in the field in the late 70s and early 80s, the term spiritual formation was hardly known except for highly specialized references in relation to the Catholic orders. Today it is a rare person who has not heard the term. Seminary courses in spiritual formation proliferate like baby rabbits. Huge numbers are seeking to become certified as spiritual directors to answer the cry of multiplied thousands for spiritual direction. So there's a big demand um, for these things. And this is where we're going to leave you for the first half, kind of an abrupt ending.